Hi Gators! Welcome back to the channel and very happy new 2022! So today I am here to bring you three missing persons cases that are fairly recent, so not a lot is known about them. Then again, they are based in Switzerland, Germany and Austria, and those regions tend to not um, release too much information anyway. But I thought since they haven't been covered on YouTube, and not much has been reported on them, it would be nice to bring them to you, so we could all have a listen. And without much further ado, and with that being said, let's get into them. It is the 4th of December 2017, a cold day in the town of Krems. Sleet clatters down on the icy Danube River. On this Monday morning, 20-year-old Christian Hull does not wake until 11am, when he eventually drags himself to the living room, still tired. His mother Carmen, having awaited him, immediately prepares a small snack for her son. A few hours later, Christian's best friend Kevin comes to visit. The two chat for a bit before moving to the balcony for a smoke. It is then that Christian randomly takes out his ATM card and hands it to Kevin. He asks him to please withdraw 700 euros from his account, as he himself is too lazy to do so. And Kevin was eventually going home anyway. So Kevin, being the good friend that he is, doesn't ask questions and at 6 p.m. he swiftly heads out to get the requested amount near a local supermarket. As they had nothing else to do that day, the boys arrange to meet up later in the evening, have a few drinks and play FIFA on the PlayStation. Having delivered the cash and gone home for a bit, Kevin eventually leaves his apartment in Krems Mitterau at 7 p.m. to meet his girlfriend. But they unexpectedly get into a fight so he only makes it back to Christian's place at Wilhelm Gausega C6 at 11.30 p.m. But when he arrives, he sees police officers standing in front of Christian's place, with his mother screaming for her son. As it turned out, only two hours prior, Christian had left the apartment in sweatpants, sports shoes and a jacket to go to a cigarette vending machine some five minutes away and buy some more cigarettes. But when he didn't return for two hours, his mother began to panic and called the police. Christian also had on him his apartment key, ATM card, new iPhone and a 700 euros Kevin brought him. The only item he left behind was an old cell phone he hadn't used in a long time. Two weeks after Christian left his apartment never to return, the Lower Austria State Criminal Police Office took up his case. The lead investigator Josef Simhandel said that Christian lived a rather withdrawn life he kept to himself, which made it harder to locate him. Authorities checked his PlayStation and online activity, but that led to zero clues. Additionally, investigations were carried out in Romania, where some of Christian's family live, but that too led them nowhere, so they have virtually nothing to go on. Christian literally vanished without a trace. At first glance, he was an inconspicuous, shy young man who lost his father at the age of 11. From then on, there was only the mother, who herself had struggled with her own life as a single mom. Christian also dabbled in substance abuse, and he was a regular cannabis smoker. In fact, he had been since his teenage years. In 2015, he unfortunately suffered a drug-induced psychosis after taking ecstasy tablets which was said to have changed his personality. He withdrew, didn't keep many friends, and preferred to spend time by himself at home, either playing the PlayStation or surfing the internet. He had also attempted an apprenticeship as a floor layer, but broke that off after only a year. After that, he started another apprenticeship, this time as a painter, and quit again only two weeks in. In 2016, because he had clearly been struggling, several medical reports were drawn up to determine whether he could even work or whether he was entitled to receive social benefits. And it was determined that he could indeed work with the right support. So in 2017, the year of his disappearance, he was regularly visited by a psychologist from the Krems Psychosocial Service and they established good report. Christian even began to feel more confident again 
and told his mother how he'd love to have his own apartment one day. Carmen also said that her son was making plans for the future, and he felt optimistic. According to the psychologist, Christian had also not uttered any dark thoughts to her. However, investigator Simhandel said that police really only have two scenarios in mind. One, that Christian had planned to end his life and maybe needed the money to put things into motion. Or two, homicide. When it comes to the former, Simhandel considers the River Danube's proximity to Christian's apartment. Fire Brigade Commander Gerhard Urschler explained how should a body drown in the Danube, it would sink and stay down at first. And if the water is very cold, it could stay there several weeks. During this time, the body would glide along the bottom of the river, hit gravel and stones with great force, and eventually fall apart piece by piece. Urschler said that the likelihood of finding remains like that was slim. A friend of Christian's, Monika, said that she is certain that the local drug scene had something to do with his disappearance. She said that in 2017, she found out that Christian not only consumed cannabis, but he was also involved in dealing drugs. Monika further said that he enjoyed visiting betting establishments and even viewed him as a gambling addict. She further said that in her opinion, Murder is very unlikely, as Krims is a safe city and homicides there are unheard of. Kevin himself thinks that Christian simply went abroad to Germany to be with his, as he called them, gaming friends, the people Christian would play video games with on the PlayStation. In fact, on December the 4th, the last known message he left to anyone was to one of those online friends. It read, I have until 6 o'clock and then I have to do something. Christian's whereabouts are still unknown to this day, and nothing new has been reported since last year. It is September the 25th, 2019. Yolanda, a 23-year-old architecture student in the city of Leipzig, is sat writing a shopping list for her trip to Ikea. On a small notepad, she scribbles down the following. An opaque curtain with a rod, a desk lamp, and flower pots. Her precise destination is the IKEA store in Güntersdorf, west of Leipzig. And Yolanda had already made plans for the evening, too. She was to attend a university event at Giebichenstein Castle in Halle with a friend. Around 3 p.m., she then leaves her apartment at Körnerstrasse, located in Centrum Süd, so center south of the city, to drive to the store on the A9 motorway some 18 kilometers away. But to this day, it is unclear if she ever made it to the store. And Yolanda never shows up at the event that evening either, nor does she respond to her friend's calls or return to her shared flat. Police are quickly called and search the route from her flat to the store with tracking dogs. And sure enough, they swiftly pick up a scent. The dogs lead investigators to the nearby Südplatz stop, on Karl Liebknechtstrasse. However, it is unknown whether the scent is a new or old one. Police eventually suspect that Yolanda Klug wanted to take a 131 bus from Leipzig's Westplatz to Güntersdorf, saying that that would be the only possible connection by public transport. Unfortunately, the buses in the German city do not have CCTV footage, and police could therefore not say for certain whether she actually took the bus in the end. Police eventually also searched her university, the Kunsthochschule Burg Giebichenstein, and the local hospital with around 100 officers. 60 volunteers also joined the search around the IKEA branch, but without any luck. Authorities also noted that Yolanda had bought a plane ticket to Jordan the day before her disappearance, which they claim speaks for a voluntary disappearance. However, her father disputes this and doesn't think she just up and leave like that. Yolanda was also known to have frequent fainting spells, which authorities think may indicate an accident. But they also wonder, if that were the case, wouldn't she have been found by someone? Up until this day, there has been no significant lead in Yolanda's case and the case is still ongoing. On the day of her disappearance, Yolanda wore a dark jacket a dark hat, and a small dark backpack. She is 1.65 meters tall, 
has an athletic figure, dark blonde, straight, medium length hair, a heart shaped hairline, and a nose piercing. She speaks German without an accent, has pale skin and blue eyes. Yolanda also speaks English, Arabic, and French. It is the year 2009 when Emmanuel Muscani arrives in Switzerland from Eritrea. Upon his arrival, Emmanuel goes through the usual admission procedure for asylum seekers in Switzerland. First, he lives in a reception center, then for a few months in the Landeck Transit Center in Wiennacht. Eventually, he is assigned to the parish of Wolfhalden. There, he moves into a three-bedroom apartment above a school, which he shares with two other refugees. He also finds work at a kebab shop in Haydn, where he stays until September 2011, when he decides to quit in order to pursue a German language course. You see, Emmanuel hoped to bring over his family from Eritrea, and for that he ideally needed to move out. The place was just too small, and that is why he really wanted to become fluent in German and hopefully find better work one day. At this point, he had already secured the relevant permit from the Federal Office for Migration to bring his wife to Switzerland, so all appeared to be going according to plan. On September the 29th, 2011, Emmanuel phones his boss in the afternoon, however, what was said is undisclosed. Then, towards the evening, his sister-in-law tries to contact him on his mobile phone. The phone rings, but Emmanuel doesn't answer. After countless attempts to reach him, his phone eventually stops ringing at 10 p.m. And from that moment onwards, the family never hears from Emmanuel again. That evening, a flatmate of his reports him missing to the Appenzell Außerroden police. The next day, his brother, Michiale, who himself moved to Zurich in 2008 with his wife, also reports him as missing to the Zurich police. Emmanuel had actually planned to spend two weeks at his brother's flat, as his German class had broken off for the term, but he never showed. The police then began their search on October the 3rd, four days after Emmanuel was reported as missing. But when searching his flat, officers found no clues as to his whereabouts. Emmanuel's items and clothes appeared untouched, and his ID cards were on the table. The lead investigators said that when they found his ID card and passport, they began to suspect that he in fact didn't leave voluntarily. Authorities then searched the local area, including hospitals, unsuccessfully. They also traced his phone, but that led nowhere as he hadn't appeared to have used it, at least not on Swiss soil. Swiss police also said that despite the brother consenting to their using Emmanuel's photograph, he is yet to provide them with one. Five days after the disappearance, 80 Eritrean refugees traveled to Wolfhalden to help look for Emmanuel, but without success. Authorities eventually decided to head over to Emmanuel's flat and secure his DNA off of his toothbrush and razor to keep it on file just in case. But shortly after, the case was sadly closed due to a lack of leads. So what could have happened to Emmanuel? His brother said that he rules out a return to Eritrea, saying that nobody that escapes the country would ever go back there as it would be far too dangerous. His brother also said that to his knowledge, Emmanuel was not depressed, he had no financial worries or any other known troubles. Additionally, Emmanuel was a devout Orthodox Christian, so it is unlikely that he would have ended his life as that act is considered sinful in Christianity. But Emmanuel's former manager, the kebab shop owner, tells a different story. He said that Emmanuel told him that both the parish and his wife were putting immense pressure on him to find work again as soon as possible. His wife urged him to earn money so that she can speed up her own move and join him in Switzerland. When police then looked into the permit he had secured for his family, they found out that her planned relocation had failed. The reasons for that are unknown. Meanwhile, the head of the Swiss Support Committee for Eritrea believes that perhaps he did indeed choose to end his life. He explains that upon arriving in Switzerland, many refugees struggle to deal with the trauma the grueling journey causes them, and neither he nor Emmanuel's brother believe that he ran away to hide somewhere else, as he left his documents behind. 
Nevertheless, police made an inquiry to Italy, because the Eritrean diaspora there is older and larger than it is in Switzerland. But even this path had not shed any light on the case. His brother thinks that perhaps he was kidnapped. But who should have abducted him? And why? There was never a ransom note either. Emanuel has now been gone for 11 years, and there has not been an update since. Sadly, that is all there is to these cases. If there is an update, I will of course link that below or mention it in a community tab post. But for now, this is all there is. Um, thank you for watching. I hope you're all well and see you on the next one. Bye, Gators.